Welcome to session five, What's in the Pipeline? Presentations from industry-based scientists. My name is Jonathan Shapiro. I'm from the Sheba Medical Center in Tel Aviv, and I have the pleasure of chairing this session. During the next hour, we'll be allowed a unique opportunity to hear from doctors and scientists from pharmaceutical companies involved in antiviral and vaccine development, what we might expect to see in the near future. We will have a brief presentation from a number of companies with a major commitment to HIV drug and vaccine development, followed by a roundtable discussion. With that, let me introduce our first speaker. Kathleen Squires is Global Director of Scientific Affairs for HIV in Merck Research Labs. Previously, she was the Paul and Ida Havens Professor of Infectious Diseases at the Sidney Kimmel Medical College of Thomas Jefferson University and Director of the Division of Infectious Disease at Thomas Jefferson University Hospitals. We're delighted to have her presenting the Merck Pipeline in a talk titled Islachavir as the Foundation of Novel Prevention and Treatment Regimens. Thank you for the introduction, and I'd like to thank the conference organizers for this opportunity to discuss with you um, the Merck HIV Pipeline. As you can see outlined on this slide, Islatravir, which is a novel non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor, is really the foundation for our HIV treatment and prevention um, development program. And outlined on the slide are the uh, programs for both treatment and prevention that I'm going to be discussing with you over the next several moments. So on this slide, you can see the chemical structure of Islatravir, and in color are the moieties on the structure that are responsible for its inhibitory properties. Four prime acinyl groups responsible for inhibition of translocation, and the combination of the four prime acinyl and three prime hydroxyl groups responsible for delayed chain termination. And it is a combination of all of these inhibitory uh, properties which uh, result in multiple mechanisms and they contribute to the high potency of Islatravir against HIV-1 and drug-resistant variants and its high barrier to resistance. What I've outlined for you on this slide are what we believe are those attributes of Islatravir that uniquely positions it to be the foundation of treatment and prevention uh, regimens. So uh, is high potency, it's unique resistance profile. It has been safe and very tolerable in clinical studies to date. It has a long half-life and it does have a favorable tissue distribution. So the first program that I wanna talk to you is the one circled here, the once daily is Latravir Duravarine program. This is the design for the phase two ongoing study, and we've now presented data in the study up through week 96. So I won't spend very much time on the study design, just want to remind you that everybody who participated in this study were treated with three drugs um, at the beginning, uh, with three different uh, red dosing regimens of Islatravir. And after week 20, when patients were uh, achieved virologic suppression, uh, less than 50 copies per mil, uh, they then had the third drug, 3TC, dropped from their regimen, and the control arm of Duravarine, 3TC, and Tenofovir continued. On this next slide, um, these are the 96-week results uh, by FDA snapshot approach, which were presented at HIV Glasgow. You can see uh, continued high levels of virologic suppression across all five treatment arms a little uh, lower rate at the highest treatment dose of 2.25 milligrams, but this was really driven primarily by patients who came off study. And what is outlined on this slide uh, is, are the seven people in the study who exhibited protocol-defined virologic failure, which was a confirmed viral load of greater than 50. As you can see in the yellow squares here, it's in each case, confirmed virologic failure rate level was less than 80 copies per mil. Um, and as you know, a clinically relevant threshold is felt to be 200 copies per mil. So this protocol, as well as the phase three program, will uh, be revised to um, have the virologic failure threshold of 200 copies per mil. 
This is a table of the ongoing phase three program. You see that there, uh, there are four clinical trials, one in high, highly treatment experienced patients, two in switch populations, one in the treatment naive population, which gives us the opportunity to look at the safety um, and efficacy of this two drug regimen in a naive patient population, as well as an adolescent trial, which will be beginning very shortly. All right, I'm now going to switch to talk about the one weekly program. And the companion drug to Islatravir in this program is MK8507, which is a novel potent non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor, um, which is currently in clinical development. We presented the initial uh, findings or, uh, of MK8507 at HIV Glasgow very recently. Preclinical and phase one data indicate that it has high antiviral potency with an IC of about 50 nanomolar and has activity against common NNRTI resistance associated patients. Its PK supports once daily oral administration. And to date, it's been well tolerated in healthy participants at doses of 1,200 milligrams as a single dose or up to 400 milligrams administered once weekly for three weeks. Antiviral efficacy, PK, and safety of single oral doses of MK507 have been assessed in a phase 1B um, proof of concept study, which demonstrated that across all doses, um, the drug reduced HIV RNA levels up to seven days following a single dose, and it was generally well tolerated at all doses evaluated. This on this slide. Um, is uh, outlined the PK profile of the drug. And the bottom line here really is that doses of 100 milligrams or above exceeded the PK target of 300 nanomolar at one week. This PK uh, or this target threshold was really defined by performing a meta-analysis looking at thresholds across um, the NNRTI class. And outlined on this study are the viral load declines um, that were demonstrated in the uh, proof of concept uh, study. As I mentioned, at, for all levels, we saw at least a one load, one log uh, decline in viral load at day seven. You will note that one participant uh, who received the highest dose of 600 milligrams did uh, develop the viral isolate, did develop an F227C. Uh, uh, this is a rare mutation. In fact, Islatravir exhibits hypersusceptibility against this uh, mutation. And we do not feel when um, MK507 is co-administered with Islatravir that this particular mutation will be clinically relevant. Outlined in this slide is the study design for the phase two uh, study for the weekly regimen of MK8507 and Islatravir. Three doses of MK8507 um, will be combined with 20 milligrams of Islatravir uh, and compared to a control arm of Victegravir, FTC, and PATH. Um, it's a three-part uh, trial. Uh, the three uh, MK8507 arms will be then folded into one arm when the uh, dose of MK8507 that, is, uh, that will be taken forward in phase three trials is determined, um, and then patients will go forward from there. This uh, study will be uh, beginning um, shortly. Okay, now moving on to prevention. I want to start by talking about the once monthly Islatravir program. And outlined on this slide is the study design for the phase two safety and PK study of monthly Islatravir in infected HIV, uninfected individuals who are at low risk for HIV infection. There are two doses that are being studied, 50 milligrams and 120 milligrams. This is an intensive study that will look at a tissue PK sampling. Uh, characterize the terminal elim elimination phase or the so-called PK tail, as well as a look at drug, drug interactions with long-acting hormonal contraceptives. This trial is ongoing um, and the phase three uh, program um, is, is in the planning stages. 
And finally, I wanted to mention a couple of words about the Islatravir implant for pre exposure prophylaxis. Uh, we really have taken advantage of the expertise that we have in terms of um, Nexplanon or Implanon, which is a contraceptive implant. What you can see here is the Nexplanon implant. Uh, the Islatravir implant will be the same size. So Size here and see a cross section of the implant. And on this slide, you can see the phase one study that compared two doses of Islatravir, 54 milligrams and 62 milligrams, uh, compared to a placebo implant. These implants were placed for three months, and we followed uh, the triphosphate levels of Islatravir um, across uh, all of uh, these patients. And as you can see, in terms of the uh, mean levels that were achieved, uh, they were above the PK threshold throughout uh, the interval that the um, implant was in place. The implants were generally well tolerated throughout the 12 weeks um, and generally mild local, there were generally mild local, uh, local and tolerable effects. And finally here, on the basis of modeling using the levels uh, that we saw in the implant study, as well as levels from uh, across the treatment um, program, uh, the modeling suggests that at the 62 milligrams, we would be able to achieve uh, 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 levels of the triphosphate above the threshold throughout at least one year of dosing and uh, probably longer period of time. So I'm just finishing up here by again uh, putting, bringing up the slide, which shows you our ongoing development program for both treatment as well as prevention. We remain interested in uh, studying this latrovir um, bullet potential. And thank you uh, for. Thank you very much, Kathleen. Our next speaker will be Hanukkah Schutmacher. She is the Global Head of Viral Vaccine Discovery and Translational Medicine and the Disease Area Stronghold Leader for Viral Vaccines in Janssen Vaccines and Prevention. She is also a Professor in Virology at the Amsterdam University Medical Center. We are delighted to have Hanukkah present a talk titled Janssen's Efforts in the Development of HIV and COVID-19 Vaccines. Thank you very much for this very kind introduction. It is uh, a pleasure for me to give you an update on Jensen's effort in the development of an HIV and COVID-19 vaccine. I have uh, a conflict of interest as an employee of Johnson Vaccine and a shareholder of Johnson & Johnson. So within Janssen, we are using uh, the EdVac technology to build our vaccines, and we have applied this technology indeed for both our HIV and COVID-19 vaccine candidates. By now, we have extensive clinical experience with this platform. It has been used now in over 100,000 participants in the different programs, and these participants were in different age groups, different geographies, uh, HIV-positive adults, etc. So we have really a wide uh, range of experience now. These uh, at 26 based uh, vaccines are using the adenovirus 26 as a vector. So we have made this virus completely innocent by deleting part of the genome and using that room to put in a transgene to which we want to elicit immunity in the context of a vaccine. And we know that our at 26 based vaccines are well tolerated in the different populations where we have used them and that they induce good humoral and cellular immune responses with uh, specific uh, functionalities. We also have invested quite a lot in uh, production uh, using a complementing cell line for the missing piece in the genome that makes the virus by itself replication incompetent. And on this cell line, we have been able to produce high yields of vaccine doses with a small footprint potentially resulting in lower capex and lower cost of goods. By now, we have one vaccine approved based on this technology. This is our Ebola vaccine that was approved in Europe on July 1st of this year. We uh, use sort of the same strategy across our programs. We really like to see first preclinical efficacy of the vaccine candidate. 
by performing uh, animal studies with the vaccine and then challenge with uh, as close as possible uh, vex, uh, virus to uh, what we try to achieve protection to in the human population. Then we try to bridge this efficacy and the immune correlate associated with it with clinical data uh, obtained in phase 1 to A studies, so clinical immunogenicity data to sort of predict which regimen would likely give similar levels of protection as we have seen in non-human primates or uh, other appropriate animal models. And only if we have that level of comfort, we proceed to phase 2B3 studies to get the real clinical efficacy in the human population. This is data from a preclinical study with our HIV vaccine, uh, where you can see that after vaccination with different regimens and subsequent challenge with a shift uh, virus, that we obtain significant level of protection when we use the combination of F26 based vaccine and a enveloped trimeric protein. And this was the information that we used to further build our clinical development plan. Because from this study, we could establish that M specific antibodies and T cells correlated with protection against shift challenge. And we use these immune parameters to also set the bar for human immunogenicity based on which we would decide to proceed to phase 2B and 3 studies. These criteria are listed here. I will not go into detail. I have presented them uh, in, in earlier uh, cases. Um, but we tested also in the humans the uh, different regimens that we had tested in the non-human primates, and we had set targets for performance uh, of the vaccine uh, relative for these different immune parameters. And uh, what we observed was that uh, not all regimens met this uh, predefined uh, criteria, and only two regimens uh, did, which was again vector followed by vector plus protein, uh, either uh, uh, F26-based or MVA-based, and in the end, we selected the F26 uh, regimen, uh, containing regimen, because obviously that had uh, operational advantages over uh, the MVA-based regimen. We are currently uh, executing two efficacy studies with our vaccine regimen, which contains of two doses of F26, uh, vac based uh, vaccines and then two doses of F26 based vaccine plus the envelope protein. We are in uh, a fully enrolled uh, phase 2B study in South Southern Africa called Imbokodo, uh, which is being executed in young women. And uh, we, we hope to get results from that study uh, in, in the course of next year. And we are currently enrolling the Mosaico study, which is um, a study in uh, MSM and, and transgender individuals. And uh, doing that across uh, Europe and the Americas, uh, because there's a different HIV plate uh, preference there uh, to also get information on uh, potential protection against both those clades and uh, the that in that transmission route. In the meantime, we have also started working on a vaccine against COVID. Um, I forgot to say on the previous slide that, of course, the COVID pandemic has impacted the timelines of our HIV program, but we are trying uh, to catch up, of course, on those. For our COVID vaccine, we use similar technology. So in this case, we put uh, a piece of DNA uh, encoding for the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 into the F26 vector. We have worked on multiple designs of this uh, spike protein to get optimal stabilization and expression, leading to optimal immunogenicity and also manufacturability in the context of F26. And in, uh, from, from a large panel of, of uh, variants, so we, we had 12 uh, mentioned here, but in, in reality, we had even more. Uh, we selected a lead candidate called f 26 cov 2 s Based on preclinical studies, and I'm only listing here, so again, following the same approach that first we want to see efficacy in preclinical models, uh, we, we build our clinical program. And the most uh, interesting piece, I would say, or most um, outstanding piece of preclinical data is shown in this slide, where we immunize non-human primates and challenge them six weeks later with SARS-CoV-2. Uh, we monitored foremia in the lung and in the nose. Uh, and you can see here in the middle uh, animals that received uh, sham vaccination that after challenge with SARS-CoV-2, we had clear uh, demonstration of foremia, uh, both in the lung and in the nose. Uh, that was uh, 
uh, lasting for at least uh, uh, 10 days in some animals and, and some, some cleared a little bit sooner, but you can see that there's clearly a positive signal. On the contrary, in the animals that received the active vaccine, no viremia could be demonstrated in the lung, and only one out of six animals have transient and low viremia in the nose uh, after vir uh, viral challenge. Based on this data and an extensive uh, uh, additional data package obtained in preclinical studies, we moved into the clinic in a phase one to a study where we had three different cohorts. Uh, cohort one uh, individuals from 18 to 55 year old, cohort three individuals above 65 year old, and cohort two, uh, again the younger group, but this cohort would only start if we had uh, identified the regimen that we would use in phase three, and cohort two would then serve uh, as uh, an extension for safety and immunogenicity data. In this cohort one and three, we tested uh, a lower dose of the vaccine, five times 10 to the 10th virus particle as a double uh, or single vaccination regimen. And we also tested one times 10 to the 11th virus particles, again, as a double or as a single regimen. And the study was placebo controlled. Primary objective was safety and reactogenicity in both age groups and secondary objective was uh, immunogenicity of the vaccine. Um, we started uh, the study in uh, Belgium in July with uh, first a sentinel cohort. When that uh, went well, we fully enrolled cohort one, so the, 15, the 18 to 55 year olds. And uh, only when that uh, was done, we started enrolling cohort three. Uh, and we did an interim analysis at day 29 post uh, uh, first vaccination. And for sake of time, I only summarize the data. So uh, we had uh, acceptable safety and tolerability uh, at both uh, vaccine dose levels. There was a trend for higher reactogenicity with higher dose level and younger age. Uh, a single shot of f 26 cov 2 s elicited neutralizing antibody responses in more than 90% of participants, and also a very nicely th one skew T-cell response. And uh, the, the vaccine had similar immunogenicity at both dose levels and in uh, all age groups. So based on this, we proposed to FDA to start a phase three study and the FDA approved to proceed with that phase three clinical study to test the efficacy of one dose of five times 10 to the 10 virus particles of f 26 cov 2 s And this trial started on September 21st. Here's an overview of the uh, overall clinical program as uh, we have currently uh, ongoing or planned. So the first in human study continues. Uh, we are now in the phase of the second dose of, uh, of participants. We are also doing uh, a study, a phase one study in Japan, which is now also fully enrolled. And we have a fully enrolled phase two study ongoing in the Netherlands, Germany and Spain, where we are testing additional dose levels and also different intervals between doses to, to potentially go to a facilitated uh, regimen or a dose sparing regimen if possible. The phase three study that I told you about this ensemble is now enrolling in, in US and soon will expand to South Africa, Brazil and other uh, Latin American countries. And we are planning for a phase three efficacy study uh, where we will test a two dose regimen for uh, efficacy, so protective efficacy in target population. As soon as we would get a uh, protection, so an efficacy signal from our phase three study, we will apply for emergency use authorization. And uh, in, in the meantime, we are already producing vaccine at scale uh, should we uh, get the positive signal out of our trial so that we would have a, a stockpile um, in case we would get uh, EUA. In parallel, we will also prepare BLA so it doesn't stop uh, with the EUA. Uh, it must be clear from all this work that uh, there's a tremendous group of people involved. Uh, I, I want to mention specifically uh, the HIV team and all our collaborators, and also uh, specifically uh, the, the people who are working on the COVID-19 program with a lot of support from WARDA and from US government. And I would like to uh, thank the Janssen team as well for their um, tireless efforts uh, already since January. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Hanneke.
Our next speaker is Kirsten White, who is a Senior Director of Clinical Virology of HIV and Emerging Viruses at Gilead Science. Kirsten has worked for nearly 20 years in antiviral drug development with a focus on resistance. We're delighted to have Kirsten speak to us on the Gilead Pipeline. Thank you to the organizers for the invitation to share the 2020 update of the Gilead HIV Pipeline. There are three pillars of the HIV Pipeline to simplify and improve treatment, to expand prevention, and to achieve cure. One important goal is to simplify and improve treatment for those living with HIV. Gilead aims to offer patients a broad range of dosing modalities with long-acting ARV regimens and address the unmet medical needs of highly treatment-experienced patients. Our novel first-in-class capsid inhibitor is being developed to meet both of these needs. Lenacapavir, formerly GS6207, is the first-in-class HIV capsid inhibitor. Capsid is a multimeric shell that is essential to viral replication. Lenacapavir disrupts proper capsid disassembly and nuclear transport prior to provirus integration. Post-integration, LEN prevents the proper encapsidation and assembly of mature capsids, leading to non-infectious virion-like particles. LEN is active against all HIV subtypes, HIV with resistance to all other drug classes, including maturation inhibitors, and is the backbone of our long-acting program. In the phase 1b study of single doses of lenacapavir administered subcutaneously, the viral load decrease at day 10 ranged from minus 1.3 log for the 20 milligram dose to greater than 2 logs at the 450 and 750 milligram doses. This magnitude of response is comparable to that of integrase inhibitors. In this study, there were no SAEs related to study drug, most AEs were mild to moderate, and there were no early discontinuous. The formulation of LEN was further optimized to a 300 milligram per mil dose. At a 900 milligram dose, LEN concentrations reached greater than six-fold above the protein-adjusted EC95 and maintained these levels out to six months. To increase exposure during the first month of dosing, an oral tablet has also been developed. The LEN 300 milligram oral tablet rapidly achieves concentrations above the target six-fold protein-adjusted EC95 with a half-life of approximately 12 days. There is significant accumulation with multiple doses and minimal food effect. This oral tablet can be used for PK loading, an oral lead-in for the LEN lock acting injectable, and for weekly oral therapy. Putting this all together, the administration of LEN in the phase 2-3 trials is shown here. LEN will be administered as 600 milligrams orally on days one and two, 300 milligrams on day eight, and then at day 15, 900 milligrams of LEN sub-Q, followed by administration every six months. But what about resistance? In vitro dose escalation experiments showed resistance development of N72D followed by Q76H. In total, seven substitutions in capsid have been identified. Q67N has a six-fold resistance to LEN and has wild-type replication capacity. The other mutations had higher levels of resistance and lower infectivity. In the dose-finding study, only Q67N was found to develop in patients and occurred at only the two lowest doses, both of which are much lower than the doses being studied in phase three. Based on its broad and potent activity against HIV with resistance to all other drug classes, FDA has granted LEN breakthrough therapy designation for the treatment of HIV infection in heavily treatment experienced patients with multidrug resistance in combination with other, other antiretroviral drugs. Of course, in people living with HIV, LEN should be used with other antiretrovirals, and Gilead has a number of discovery programs committed to identifying appropriate partners for LEN, both for injectable two-drug regimens and for weekly oral two- and three-drug regimens. The second pillar is to expand prevention. We aim to meet diverse needs of persons at risk of acquiring HIV using daily or long-acting antiretrovirals. In this prevention space, we are expanding our clinical data on FTAP in women and initiating the study of lenacapavir sub-Q. 
The first study of lenacapavir or FTAF for PrEP in adolescents, girls, and young women at risk for HIV. Treatment arms are len sub Q every six months with either daily FTAF or FTDF placebo. The second arm is daily oral FTAF with len sub Q placebo every six months. And the third group is daily oral FTDF with len placebo. There are two primary endpoints at week 52 of LEN or FTAF versus background HIV incidence. The second study is in men and transgender women who have sex with men. Participants are randomized to LEN every six months or daily oral FTDF, each with a placebo, and the primary endpoint is at week 52 and is LEN versus background HIV incidence. The third pillar is to achieve cure where we are focusing on latency reversal agents, immune modulators, anti-envelope antibodies, also known as broadly neutralizing antibodies, and therapeutic vaccines. The goal here is to identify a finite duration therapy that achieves durable art-free HIV remission without transmission or disease progression. There are two phases to this strategy, activation and reduction of the reservoir, and then control or eradication. Latency reversal agents have not translated well from preclinical models to humans, and there is room for further discovery here. Gilead has de been developing immune modulators to enhance the activation of immune cells using the TLR7 agonist, lefitolimod or vesitolimod. The reservoir may also be reduced using bro broadly neutralizing antibodies. In addition to antibodies, T cell mediated immunity is critical and this will be enhanced using therapeutic vaccines. Animal studies from a few years ago found that combination approaches were going to be needed to achieve cure. Here, studies in non-human primates use the TLR7 agonist, vesitolimod, with a broadly neutralizing antibody or with a therapeutic vaccine. With the BNAB, five of 11 monkeys had no rebound through 160 days. With the vaccine, there was a different phenotype where all animals rebounded and three of nine became controllers. At CROI this year, these double combinations were repeated and the triple combination of vesitolimod vaccine of AD26 with an MVA boost and the broadly neutralizing antibody PGT121 were presented by Dan Baruch. The schedule of administration of each agent is shown here. With no treatment, the SHIV infected monkeys all rebounded following ART discontinuation. One very important finding was that the previous studies of VES with PGT121 or vaccine were reproduced. VES with PGT121 had four of 12 monkeys controlling with no rebound due to low or no reservoir. This may be a reservoir killing strategy. VES with the AD26 MVA vaccine had all animals rebound, but then three of 12 controlled. This is inducing a state of functional cure. With the triple combination, there was a blend of phenotypes. Some animals did not rebound and others rebounded, but then controlled. This effect seemed to be additive and in total six of 10 animals controlled their virus. This very exciting triple combination strategy is progressing into a clinical trial. I'd like to end with an overview of the Rich Gilead HIV pipeline. To simplify and improve treatment, we are developing lenacapavir for highly treatment experienced patients, as well as for suppressed individuals. Also for highly treatment experienced patients, the unboosted protease inhibitor GS1156 is now in phase one. To find a partner for LEN, we have a number of preclinical programs spanning long acting integrase inhibitors, NNRTIs, NRTIs and BNABs. For prevention, we are expanding our studies of FTAF and starting studies of LEN as a long acting agent. For cure, we are working on combination strategies that include immune modulators, vesitolimod and lefitolimod, broadly neutralizing antibodies, elipovimab, formerly GS9722, GS9723, and the BNAVs acquired from Rockefeller, GS5423 and 2872. We are working with a number of vaccines, including a collaboration with ALIX to be used in combination with VES and early stage discovery vaccines with Hukipa. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Kirsten. Our next speaker is Michael Abood. 
Michael is global franchise medical head at Vive Healthcare, responsible for medical strategy across the portfolio of HIV products. Prior to entering the industry, he cared for HIV patients at Guy's and St. Thomas's hospitals in London. We're delighted to have Michael speak to us on Vive's pipeline. Thank you for the introduction. It's an honor to be with you today and to present the Vive pipeline. First, my disclosures. I'm a full-time employee of Vive Healthcare. I'd like to start this presentation by acknowledging that our ultimate ambition, which we share with many of you in this forum, is to eventually achieve remission and cure for HIV. We contribute to this piece of work through significant external collaborations. For example, that outlined on this slide under the umbrella of Cura, which is a partnership with the University of North Carolina and the National Institute of Health. Until we achieve this ultimate ambition though, there remains significant unmet need for people living with HIV. Our portfolio and pipeline at Vive Healthcare seeks to address these needs that continue to evolve. People are living longer with HIV, which is fantastic. And this brings with it a lifetime of exposure to antiretroviral therapy. Our portfolio and pipeline provides option that to take less drugs and take drugs less frequently. We're also exploring new modalities of actions and drug delivery that could see long acting therapy being delivered either in the clinic or at home. When you look at special populations, we continue to innovate to bring better options for highly treatment experienced individuals. We continue to look at formulations and fix those combinations to bring the best options to the youngest children. And we are investing significantly in revolutionizing the prevention space. Looking at people living with HIV themselves, we should not underestimate the psychologic impact of daily treatment of HIV. And our long acting therapies in the pipeline could go a long way to addressing this concern. Finally, we do not believe in one size fits all, and our products offer options for individualizing HIV care. You will agree with me that we are now at an era of HIV therapy where highly active antiretroviral therapy can be achieved with both three drug regimens and two drug regimens. Our next major innovation in the two drug regimen space is long acting cabotegravir and rilpivirine. The development program for this regimen is outlined here. ATLAS, FLARE and ATLAS 2M are the pivotal studies. ATLAS and FLARE explored cabotegravir and rilpivirine LA four weekly dosing, while ATLAS 2M extended this to eight weekly dosing. The SOLA study is a phase 3B study starting soon and will compare eight weekly CAB plus Rilpivirin LA dosing to oral daily Bictavi. On the far right of this slide, you will see our focus on implementation sciences with studies both in the US and Europe, the Customize and the Carousel studies respectively. Across the pivotal studies, we see CAB and Rilpivirin demonstrating non inferiority against the comparator arms. In ATLAS and FLARE, this is oral standard of care. And in the ATLAS 2M, four weekly dosing is the comparator to eight weekly dosing. As you can see from all the bar charts, rates of virologic non-response are low and consistent across the clinical development program. Suppression rates are high and similar to those seen in the most contemporaneous studies in oral therapy in the region of 94% at the primary endpoint. We have now seen durability data in the FLARE study at two years and in the phase two LATTE2 study up to weeks 160. Importantly, across the program, we saw injection site reactions being common, but overwhelmingly of low grade, grade one and two of severity, and the reporting of these diminishes over time. In fact, only 2% of discontinuations were reported because of ISRs. One critical observation in this development program is the overwhelming preference for long acting dosing over previous oral therapy in ATLAS and FLARE. In ATLAS 2M, we also saw overwhelming preference for eight weekly dosing over four weekly dosing. Moving on to the pediatric space, we have an extensive pediatric PAN portfolio development program we're very proud of. This has recently seen the approval of Dolotegra pediatric dispersible formulations by the FDA. A similar submission is ongoing 
with the European Agency and other regulators globally. Allow me now to segue briefly to talk about long-acting Cabotegravir for prevention. Outlined here is the development program for Cab LA in PrEP. The pivotal studies are the HPTN, 083 and 084 studies, and these will soon be complemented by studies in adolescents. HPTN 083 is a double-blinded placebo-controlled study investigating efficacy of Cab LA dose every eight weeks versus oral TDF FTC for PrEP in HIV uninfected MSM and transgender women. Here you see the study design, an initial safety step with CAB oral lead-in, followed by the comparative phase of the study, looking at CAB LA versus TDF FTC. And finally, at the end of the study, a phase where TDF FTC is provided to cover the CAB PK tail for a year. In May 2020, the DSMB recommended that the blinded part of the study be stopped early for successfully meeting its pre-specified objectives. All participants will now be unblinded and offered CAB LA. Here are the primary endpoint results. The HIV incidence in the TDF FTC arm was 1.22 compared to 0.41 in the CAB LA arm. This translates to a hazard ratio of 0.34. As you can see to the right of the slide, the confidence intervals falls well outside both the non-inferiority and superiority margins, demonstrating superiority of CAB LA versus TDF FTC in preventing HIV infections in MSM and transgender women at risk. Next, let's look at drugs in the pipeline with new modalities of action. The first of these is Fostemsevir. Fostemsevir is an attachment inhibitor, binds to the envelope of GP120, inducing a conformational change which prevents binding of CD4 to GP120, thereby preventing internalization of the virus. The BRIGHT study comprises two arms, a randomized cohort and a non-randomized cohort. And the randomized cohort, Highly treatment experienced patients who are virologically failing were randomized to receive Fostemsever or placebo for eight days on top of their existing regimen. From day nine onwards, the background therapy was optimized. The non randomized arm recruited individuals with no remaining options, almost in a compassionate use fashion, and also allowed the concomitant use of ibaluzumab in some of these individuals. In the randomized cohort, we saw viral suppression rates increasing steadily from weeks 24 through to weeks 96, with a snapshot efficacy of 60% at week 96. In the observed analysis, where changes to the optimized background therapy were not considered failure, this efficacy rate rises to 79%. Substantial CD4 recovery was also observed in this study. Similarly, in the non-randomized arm, we see sustained virologic suppression rates around 37%, also translating to an efficacy rate of 59% at week 96 on the observed analysis. As we look to the future of our pipeline then, there are options for fewer drugs and less frequent dosing, chemical and biologic entities, paradigms for treatment administration in clinics or at home, and possibilities for mixing both modalities and frequency of administration. The next most advanced entity in our pipeline is the maturation inhibitor class. These represent a new mode of action blocking protease cleavage of GAG, resulting in immature viral particles. There are two molecules in this class, the lead being the oral MI254. Here you see the phase 2b study design for MI254. Three different doses of MI254 will be combined with two nukes, and each compared against a reference arm of dolotegravir plus two nukes. At week 48, which is the primary endpoint, the optimal dose of MI254 will then be taken forward as a two-drug regimen with dolotegravir. So to conclude, I believe that we have a portfolio and pipeline that addresses many of the ongoing key unmet needs of people living with HIV and brings options to both prescribers and people living with HIV, extending treatment beyond oral, beyond daily dosing, and that will really allow us to individualize care, and a potential step change in how PrEP is delivered, which could contribute to making a significant impact on the global epidemic. Thank you.
Thank you to all our speakers. Uh, those were fantastic talks. As someone who treats uh, HIV patients every week, it's like being in a candy store, looking at all these fantastic options coming up. We, we keep thinking we have it better and better for our patients. And oh, we, you know, just now one pill once a day, they're doing great, but this obviously is, is very exciting. And I think uh, a lot to look at. We, we have questions coming in from the audience, but I actually want to start with, with uh, a question for all of you, maybe going around the room. Uh, we're seeing a lot about long acting. You know, Many of us dreamed about the day we could just give patients one pill once a day, and obviously now we're, we're, we're looking for better and better. So how do you personally see the future? So in five or 10 years, will most of our patients still be taking a pill a day? Or will these options, I think we've seen so many, will these really um, be something most of our patients will be taking? Will these will our patients be taking a pill once a week or an injection once every few months or have a, uh, something slipped under their skin or once a year? So how do you think this will really become a reality in, in the next, uh, let's say, decade or so? Uh, Kate, what do you think? So I think the issue for patients is that they want individualization and they want to be able to kind of change their regimens depending on their life circumstances. So I do think there's a trend towards focusing on drugs less than one stable, mm -hmm. you know, kind of episodically. Um, and I, from all the presentations, mine as well as the other ones that I've listened to, that there's a realization there on, on the part of drug developers that really is kind of the next step for for patients um, and for clinicians to be able to offer that that opportunity. I still see patients, and there, although many of them are doing very well, there is there's still to be effective for a while. Question: There's something that I can do that I don't have to take until every. Day. No. Thank you, Kristen. You showed. Some uh, interesting data. I think that's is this something which will become a main a mainstay of treatment, or would this be for the anecdotal patients? I, I agree with Kathleen that it's it's all about choice. You know, it, I think that each patient is going to have their own preferred method um, of taking uh, their ART. Um, you know, we're also seeing multiple different modalities for prevention. Yes. Um, I think it's really exciting times that that we're not done, even though many of us thought we were done when we came up with one pill once a day with zero resistance in clinical trials, you know, that a number of regimens have. Um, but, you know, things are changing and we're listening to patients now and, and really realizing that we have more work to do. In addition, the cure space is just in its infancy. So I think we have a, a lot of work to do and it's exciting times ahead. Oh, wonderful. Michael, you actually showed us data that patients preferred once every two months. Um, was this, so is this really something which we're, we'll, we'll move into the mainstream? And also a question about maybe administration. Do you think these will have to be administered in the clinic or will we get to the stage where maybe patients don't even have to come to the clinic? How do you think the future will look? Thank you, John. I, I think it's difficult to add a lot to your initial question onto what the, the ladies have just uh, Outline, but but it really energizes me to see what what is going on in every company's pipeline. And the fact that we all uh, at this point in time singing the same tune around, bringing more options and more modalities of care to individualized care. Um, to your subsequent questions, I, I think that um, we had noticed very early on in the Cabotegra program, Cabotegra program, long acting program, that there's a strong um, preference for lesser frequency of dosing. And this really came out in, 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 the, in the data from the studies. Uh, we see the preference for four weekly dosing in Atlas and Flair, and then for eight weekly over, and then four weekly, let alone oral therapy, oral daily uh, therapy. Uh, so I think that um, this is definitely the way forward and, and it's been outlined in every major industry players uh, pipeline as we just in this session, Jonathan. And I do believe that um, there will come a time when we will have a mixed approach to this. I do not believe that all care will be injectable, that all care will be um, through a, uh, a disposable pen, subcutaneous at home. I think we will see some patients who prefer to stay on a single pill or oral therapy. We'll see patients who want to come to clinic and get their healthcare provider administer their injection. And we'll see others that prefer to have a device at home that, that makes life easier for them. So I think it's that those options that really makes the, the future of all our pipelines really exciting. 
Can I ask a specific question about the design of the trial? I think you, you explained some of that, but the question was who would be the patients enrolling? So I guess, will this be for treatment experience, the initial study, the, the switch study? I think it's a question from our colleague from, from Paris. I'm, oh, um, sorry, I didn't realize that was for me. I don't know, uh, it's, it's, it's for, for Kate, I think. This is for you, oh, Kate? Okay. Kate, it's for you, it's for you. It's actually for you, it's not the caption over there, yes. Uh, so, okay, um, all right. So sorry, I didn't really have time to go over the studies in uh, So there are two switch studies. One is a switch study people coming in on a variety of baseline regimens open label study and they are going to stay on that baseline regimen or they're going to be switched to the combination of the rabbit and Swatrovir. The other study is a blinded study for people who are on Victarvi who are going to remain on Victarvi or to be randomized um, randomized to stay on or, or to switch to the double. So um, in terms of a resistance, I have to say that I'm trying to remember across the two studies, there are slightly different eligibility criteria, as you might imagine, depending on what the gas levels are. So, um, but uh, they can have some resistance, but I, I would have to look it up to make sure I do not speak incorrectly here. I can also say that the studies have been open. It's not will, they are actively ongoing um, and very close to enrollment. So Kirsten, on resistance, uh, since the, you and I have been working on a long time, you know, we, 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 we were concerned, I guess, in the era of, of NRTIs that we were going to have an explosion of resistance. Um, and that certainly didn't happen. But it seems from seeing everyone's presentation, the companies are addressing this issue of resistance uh, in their drug development. We already have drugs which are resulting in very little uh, resistance. Are we going to, is this going to be something really which becomes less of an issue? I mean, we really see a reduction. We know that a lot of resistance that around is still hanging around from previous, and we really are seeing less. We're having uh, analysis saying it's not even cost effective to do it. What do you think the future is going to look? I mean, are they going to, uh, are we going to need to really be concerned about transcendent resistance? Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. Um, you know, when we did the development program, program for Bictegravir, we did take resistance into account. And when we synthesize molecules, we screen them against a panel of, of existing integrase resistance. So it is an important part of, it was an important part of that discovery program. And it remains an important part of our discovery programs for all of our, our new agents that we're working on. Um, luckily, yes, our job isn't quite as uh, intense as it used to be. Uh, in the days of a tripla and, and moving on to that. And resistance is pretty rare, but it's still very important. Um, and I applaud all the work that's being done on surveillance um, by all the, the countries and the universities and laboratories that are doing that, because that is really, really important. And we have to also remember that in the developing world versus developed world, the impact of resistance is different. Um, so I think resistance still is a problem in developing world, and we have to, to um, keep keep that in mind. Um, specifically for lanacapavir, some of the new newer um, classes, since it's a new class, it doesn't, there's no pre-existing resistance. And, you know, uh, a nice presentation came out by Anjan Viet Marcelin showing that, you know, there aren't any pre-existing capsid mutations um, that confer resistance to lanacapavir already circulating. So that's really good for the heavily treatment experienced patient. Um, and as I mentioned, we did have two patients who had emergent resistance in the phase, the uh, dose escalation study, but those were at the, the lowest doses and, and uh, very much below the therapeutic doses. So, you know, it all depends on its partner, but we think that resistance isn't going to be a major problem with lanacapavir, um, but we have to continue surveilling and, um, and monitoring. I think it is still important, but hopefully the rates will stay at 1% or less. I agree with you. I think that's something which will gradually change. And I think that that would be nice if, you know, if for countries that don't routinely do it, if they didn't have to, it's a lot, it's expensive, it's labor intensive. And I think, you know, the better the drugs get, the less you need the diagnostics. And I think this is, is a good example. Uh, Michael, we've been speaking about the highly treatment experienced patients. Um, I think uh, for us who, who, who treat them, we were very concerned that that is a group which has sort of been left behind. 
Uh, for STEM severe addresses it, and I think we saw in all the presentations that this has been discussed again. Uh, just a few words about that whole program, how difficult it is to, to address it and to actually take on that challenge of STEM severe, just with a few words. Yeah, it's been a fantastic uh, journey with this program, actually. As you know, most of it uh, was with uh, BMS before it came to, to be healthcare. Um, but a number of people who were working on this program from the very start came came with the program to be, and, uh, and, and they're so passionate about it, as you know, Jonathan. It's a program that's been in development for almost 20 years, just to show the amount of work that's gone into it. And finally, to, you know, for this to, to, to become, uh, uh, you know, to be realized and, and now being approved by the, by the FDA and awaiting that of, from the EMA. But I think beyond that, it's, the, it's actually seeing the benefit that comes out of, of this program. And hopefully what we'll see by HTE molecules and other, and other companies' pipelines. Just to, first of all, it says that this is a group of people living with HIV, though they're a smaller number, they're not forgotten. And the fact that we need to optimize that therapy too, it's not just about the one pill for the, for the really simple uh, HIV disease. Um, and really, we're seeing what we're seeing here with Fostensivir is a combination of really significant biologic suppression in, in patients with really advanced disease, but this really remarkable CD4 um, improvement. And as Gina, Jonathan, we are really going to invest and look into what this means. We, we've seen this before with, with previous products where you saw large CD4 increases and we didn't quite understand it. This time we want to look at that more objectively and see does it actually result in long-term better health uh, outcomes for, for, for these uh, highly treated experience patients. So really exciting space for us. Wonderful. We're getting close to the end. I want to just give each of you a minute or two. You know, um, we're seeing with the COVID how important the collaboration between, you know, governments and companies and patients. And I think we've been pretty good um, in HIV, but this isn't an opportunity. This, this session is sort of a special session where we've been trying every year to get everyone sort of closer together. And I like it especially because uh, I do see we're all on the same side. But just want to give each of you a few words, you know, Clinicians who are involved in these clinical trials, you know, what, what can we do to facilitate these efforts of the companies to get, to get us to these drugs? Just uh, the final words on this. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> clinical trials in the, in the era of COVID has been really tough. You know, I think a lot of our newer trials have been delayed in enrollment. Um, it's been very difficult to do phase one studies. Most of the phase one centers have closed. Um, I think we've all had to be very creative about how to maintain the clinical trials. Um, HIV treatment has had to move to telemedicine in, in a lot of cases. And it's, you know, it's really um, um, also decreased the rate of diagnosis in some cases um, of HIV. And certainly new prescriptions of prevention have gone down. So I, I think that, you know, hopefully we will get back into a better place. Um, but we do have to rethink how medicine and general practice is going to be. Um, you know, are we going to have more of a hybrid system in the future where we have in-person, but also telemedicine once someone is suppressed? So I, I think it's, there's a really big opportunity here to find good platforms that work um, and good, good systems that work for everybody. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Tara. So I was, I was gonna say something somewhat along the same lines. I think Really doing clinical trials and, and trying to make cases on the clinical trials is really how to test what we can do in clinical medicine. What I mean by that is we have to be very inventive, as Chris has pointed out, in terms of trying to keep people on, uh, on the clinical trials to go to them to study this, that how to do self sampling and so forth, that have not thought about doing setting of clinical trials and now translating that back into clinical practice, trying that in our clinic, for instance, never in a curriculum. And the whole idea of telemedicine, you know, HIV is very highly regimented, you have to come in every three months, so we come, it's broadened out maybe every six months, but we have to see you, we have to see you, we have to see you. And it turns out maybe we don't have to see you quite as often as we see each other on the screen like this. So. Um, I, I, COVID has, been, has taught us a lot in both clinical trials as well as the, the you know, clinical management. Michael, your thoughts? Um, just very quickly, I, I won't repeat what Kathleen and, and Kirsten have said, but I'll say that the, the lessons we've learned from COVID and how we've collaborated between the industry, academia, uh, prescribers, and the patient, we should 
we should look at build on those and, and, and continue the collaboration in our pipelines. From everything we've seen, there are drugs that can be given once a week, uh, once a month, once three months, yearly, uh, and they don't necessarily all have a partner. So while we continue to compete with each other, I think we should put the same amount of effort into collaborating if that's the best thing for, for people living with HIV. Thank you. Uh, wonderful. I think that's those are perfect closing words. And uh, let me take this opportunity to thank you all and Hanukkah for fantastic talks. This is really a, a special session. And uh, I think this, this year was fantastic. And next year, I hope we'll all be together uh, in one room together. So with that, I'll go to our, our final uh, slide. Thank you all very much. We'll be moving uh, to a break. Thank you. We'll be moving Stay to- Stay safe, everyone. Take care. Thank you. So we, if we can put on our, our, uh, our final slide. So we'll be moving to a coffee break, a short coffee break. We have another session coming up uh, afterwards. And we look forward to all of you enjoying the workshop to the end. Thank you very much. <laughs>